If you had the opportunity to ask the Savior a question, what would it be? When a certain rich young man met the Savior for the first time, he asked, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The Savior's response showed both appreciation for the good things the young man had already done and loving encouragement to do more. When we ponder the possibility of eternal life, we may similarly wonder if there's more we should be doing. When we ask in our own way, what lack I yet? The Lord can give us answers that are just as personal as his response to the young rich man. Whatever the Lord asks you us to do, acting on his answer will always require that we trust him more than our own righteousness and that we receive the kingdom of God as a little child. Marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God. The Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he who made man at the beginning made him male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall twain be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. to trap him what a, what an amazing irony here that they're coming to the creator of worlds without end they're coming to to the the god of the old testament who is now in the flesh god with us and they're tempting him instead of listening to him instead of following him instead of allowing him to heal them they're tempting him and what is their temptation is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, we need to pause here and give some historical setting uh, to, so you understand the situation of, of why they're even asking this question. There is a debate within the different schools of thought in Judaism at the time. The, the two schools are Shammai and Hillel. Shammai is very conservative, Hillel is very liberal in their interpretation of the laws in the Old Testament, or in the Torah, the five books of Moses. Keep in mind there were 613 laws in the law of Moses, and in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4, it's the one place where Moses gives this provision for divorce. The school of Shammai, the very conservative side, is saying, no, the only reason a man can give a writing of divorcement to his wife is for the cause of adultery. The school of Hallel interprets those verses in Deuteronomy very openly, very liberally, and says, no, a man can give a writing of divorcement for any cause. So Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, our most prolific uh, first century Jewish historian, who, who we have many of his writings today, he'll tell you that he himself was divorced, and he said, we can give a writing of divorcement for any cause. Then they, they even list off some examples. She doesn't please me anymore. She salted the soup too much. Uh, she talked ill of my family or of her in-laws in my presence. Uh, another woman pleased me more. Any cause you can give a writing of divorcement. And so you've got this this debate going on, and now they bring the debate to Jesus to trap him. They want him to take sides. That's right.
and they're missing the whole point. You see, their focus is on the dividing, the divorcing, the separating of people, and Christ's whole mission is on the unifying, the bringing together, the binding together of people, especially in the marriage covenant context. So it's interesting the word that's used here for divorce in the Greek. It, here in Matthew, it's one word. The same story in Mark, Mark uses a different word. So before I tell you what those Greek words are, let's just talk about the English word divorce. You've heard the word divert, or even the word die, which means two. So divorce just means a part in the way, going in different directions, turning away from one another. That's literally what it means. So the two Greek words that we find in these two different stories, so Matthew uses this word apoluo, which essentially means to set somebody free from a bond or an agreement. Mark uses a different word. Mark uses a word that you're familiar with. He uses the word apostasy, or apostasia as we call it in Greek, that there is a part of the ways, there's a falling away, an asundering. And it dawned on me as I was looking at this, that when we think about apostasy, it's actually divorcing ourselves from God. We are moving in a different direction from God. We are diverting ourselves from him. So it's interesting, these stories just use two different words that both have similar outcomes that people are leaving one another. And we should also make it clear that the principle that Jesus is teaching is about binding people together. And some people have looked at Jesus' teachings, and we today almost have people debating, like Shammai and Hillel, about Jesus' words and missing the principle about Jesus is inviting us to be bonded together with God. It's fascinating to me that Jesus was asked this question in a tempting sort of a way by these Pharisees. It's interesting to watch how he responds, because once again, their, their intent isn't to learn truth. They're trying to trap him, so he doesn't teach them much of the higher law. He sends them back to the old law, back to the Old Testament. Look at verse 4, and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Yeah, this underlying word of being cleaved or united, uh, the Greek word is related to our English word glue. So think about what glue does. It binds things together. So the principle Jesus is teaching is covenantal binding. And a marriage relationship should be symbolizing the relationship that we have with God, which is interesting to go back to this word apostasy, that the word for divorce in Greek meant to kind of fall away from somebody. So I find that compelling that our marriages should be a reflection of how we are covenantly connected to God. So look at verse 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So he's, he's telling them, this is, this is not your purview to separate things that God has brought together, especially this clause, for any cause. Um, isn't it fascinating to look at the symbolism of a marriage altar in the temple of our God? When you have a man and a woman kneeling across that altar, Notice how they begin marriage. Notice the position they're in. They're kneeling. They're at an altar. What happens at an altar? Usually sacrifice. You, you have to pardon the, the play on words here. You have to alter your behavior. You have to sacrifice, give up some things. You offer some things to the person and to the Lord and you peel back layers of symbolism for what that altar represents, it's more than Old Testament and it's even more than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You peel back that layer of the atonement itself of Jesus Christ and it's… And a certain ruler asked him, saying, 
Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one. That is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things I've had kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet thou lackest one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they who have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I appreciate you say that because sometimes we jump into stories and we miss little details that are purposely put in there. Yeah. It's interesting, again, what happens that Jesus says in that verse 17, but if thou will enter into life, you want eternal life, be loyal to God, right? Keep the commandments. And then this guy, what does he say? Which one? Like, did he not understand when Jesus said commandments? That's a plural. It's not a multiple choice. It's not a buffet. And you're like, I'll just pick that one and that one. I'll leave everything else out. And so Jesus then has to summarize for him the core essence of the law of Moses revealed at Sinai, what we call the Ten Commandments. Like he says in verse 18, do no murder, do not commit adultery, don't steal, don't, don't lie, don't bear false witness, don't say things about people aren't true, honor thy father and mother. And of course, verse 20, the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? But then we get to the heart of the matter of what Jesus truly invites all of us to do at some point in our lives, that we have to dedicate all to him and not hold anything back. Did you see a pattern, by the way, in, in Jesus' response there? If you look closely at verse 18, he picked up with commandment number six, gave number seven, number eight, number nine, and then went back to number five, and then added kind of this overview of the second half of the, the Ten Commandments, which could all be summarized in how you treat people. The first four commandments are how you treat God and how you love God and stay, stay in this covenantal loyalty with him. And then five through ten, he, he didn't mention the thou shalt not covet here, number ten, but he gave all the others of the second half, which is how you interact with people, how you love your neighbor as yourself. And he, I think, as Taylor mentioned, isn't it fascinating that this young man's response was, all these things have I kept from my youth up, as if to say, yeah, I'm perfect at loving my neighbor as myself. I have no issues there. And maybe that's true. I, I would guess that he's probably not been absolutely perfect 100% of the time in that, but his question, his forward question is still extremely profound. What lack I yet? I can't picture an, a single instance for anybody kneeling down to the Lord saying, I've, I've done my best to try to do these things, and now the next step in my life, what lack I yet? I can't picture the Lord saying to anyone, nothing, you, you've arrived, you're good in this life, there's nothing you can do to, to be better at how you love your neighbor or if we could add, how you love God. But in this case, notice Jesus' response to him, verse 21, Jesus saith unto him, or said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Let go of everything that this world has given you, you're, you're very rich, let it go, and come follow me. He just got invited to be a disciple, a, a very close uh, follower of Christ, and that word disciple is interesting. It is an interesting word. Um, 
the, the word is mantheo. In fact, our word math and mathematics relates to the same word, and it literally means to be a learner. So imagine every time you read the word disciple throughout the scriptures, what if you inserted the word learner? How does that enhance or magnify your understanding of what God is asking you to do? Think about the atonement of Jesus Christ is an invitation for you to learn. The atonement of Jesus Christ is an invitation to change. Learning requires change. The only way to become like God is to change, and the atonement of Jesus Christ gives you the power, the strength, and the forgiveness to change. So these disciples are learners. They're seeking to learn. I, it's interesting here, this guy, he has these great possessions. The underlying Greek word seems to suggest that it's property. Now you think in the ancient world, uh, people didn't have pension plans and stock market access. Like your land was often the way that you provided a living for yourself. And if you didn't have land, you were dependent upon a landowner hiring you. We're going to study this about the parable of the laborers who are dependent on landowners to hire them. It would be a massive sacrifice to let go of your property. And it was a hard for him. He wasn't willing to do it. And one of the lessons I take away from this is, what possessions do I have? It may not be property, but is there some habit or some sin that I have become very comfortable with that I'm not willing to let go? I'm not really willing to learn. I'm not really willing to change. I'm not really willing to fully embrace the totality of the tone of Jesus Christ in my life. I don't want to be a real disciple. I'll be a disciple here, but not in this way. Jesus asks for total devotion. And what I love is that his grace is sufficient to give us the time to get there. Is even right now, as much as I want to be fully devoted to God, I am not yet perfect, as he said. If you are going to be completely devoted to me, here's what you need to do. So this is a very sobering uh, exchange when I read this, because I look at my own life and I realize I still have a lot that I need to let go so I can be more perfect in following Jesus. I wish to speak of the Savior's parable in which a householder went out early in the morning to hire laborers. After employing the first group at 6 in the morning, he returned at 9 a.m., at 12 noon, and at 3 in the afternoon, hiring more workers as the urgency of the harvest increased. The Scripture says he came back a final time about the 11th hour, approximately 5 p.m., and hired a concluding number then. Then just an hour later, all the workers gathered to receive their day's wage. Surprisingly, all received the same wage in spite of the different hours of labor. Immediately, those hired first were angry, saying, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day? When reading this parable, perhaps you, as well as those workers, have felt there was an injustice being done here. Let me speak briefly to that concern. First of all, it is important to note that no one has been treated unfairly here. The first workers agreed to the full wage of the day, and they received it. This parable, like all parables, is not really about laborers or wages any more than the others are about sheep and goats. This is a story about God's goodness, His patience and forgiveness, and the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a story about generosity and compassion. It is a story about grace. It underscores the thought I heard many years ago that surely the thing God enjoys most about being God is the thrill of being merciful, especially to those who don't expect it and especially feel 
they don't deserve it. I do not know who in this vast audience today may need to hear the message of forgiveness inherent in this parable. But however late you think you are, however many chances you think you've missed, however many mistakes you feel you've made, or talents you think you don't have, or distance from home and family and God you feel you have traveled, I testify that you have not traveled beyond the reach of divine love. It is not possible for you to sink lower than the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines. Whether you are not yet of our faith or were once with us and have not remained, there is nothing in either case you have done that cannot be undone. There is no problem which you cannot overcome. There is no dream that in the unfolding of time and eternity cannot yet be realized. Even if you feel you are the lost and last laborer of the eleventh hour, the Lord of the vineyard still stands beckoning. To those of you who have been blessed by the gospel for many years because you were fortunate enough to find it early, and to those of you who have come to the gospel by stages and phases later. And finally, to those of you, member or not yet member, who may still be hanging back, to each of you, one and all, I testify of the renewing power of God's love and the miracle of His grace. His concern is for the faith at which you finally arrive, not the hour of the day in which you got there. So if you've made covenants, keep them. If you haven't made them, make them. If you've made them and broken them, repent and repair them. It is never too late, so long as the master of the vineyard says there is time. Please listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit telling you right now, this very moment, that you should accept the atoning gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and enjoy the fellowship of His labor. Don't delay. It's getting late. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I should trust in God's mercy, not my own righteousness. Jesus spake this parable unto certain men who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as the publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. But the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one who exalteth himself shall be abased. And he who humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Pharisee had prayed, I thank thee that I am not a sinner, and cited the things he did to obey God. Meanwhile, the publican would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This publican went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Savior was hungry after traveling from Bethany to Jerusalem. 
and a fig tree in the distance looked like a source of few food. But as Jesus approached the tree, he found that it bore no fruit. In a way, the fig tree was like the hypocritical religious leaders in Jerusalem. Their empty teachings and outward demonstrations of holiness gave no spiritual nourishment. The Pharisees and scribes appeared to keep many commandments, yet miss the two greatest commandments, to love God and to love thy neighbor as thyself. In contrast, many people who had begun to recognize good fruit in Jesus' teachings, when he arrived at Jerusalem, they welcomed him with branches cut from trees to pave his path, rejoicing that at long last, as ancient prophecy said, thy king cometh. As you read this week, Think about the fruits of the Savior's teachings and atoning sacrifice in your life and how they can bring you forth much fruit. Universal Grace Universal Grace We must never forget Jesus' primary mission to provide salvation for all people. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. This principle comes from a very, very familiar biblical story, and I think most of us have learned it, particularly if we come out of a Christian background. We learned it as children. In fact, I remember a song we learned about this tax collector uh, who names, his name was Zacchaeus. You remember that? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, <laughs> and a wee little man was he. Some of you could sing it. You remember the tune? Oscar. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. And then it ends, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but a happy man was he. <laughs> For he had seen the Lord that day, and a happy man was he, and a very happy man was he. Now, that little song, those lyrics really capture the story of Zacchaeus that we have here. And here's, here's the story as Luke recorded it, and you can see how accurate that is in reflecting what happened. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now again, remember that tax collectors in Jesus' day were very rich people, most of them. In fact, they were hired by the Roman government. And the Roman government basically said, and remember now, a lot of these tax collectors were also Jews, because they were part of the Roman society, particularly uh, Judea, Though they had their own rules and regulations that they could practice in Judaism, yet they were under the authority of Rome. And so you could become a tax collector, and basically the rule was, collect what the Roman, Roman government demands, based on what you should pay, according to salary and so forth, and income, and material possessions. But then the Roman government said, after you get what we need and want, you can collect anything for yourself. You can add to it. Well, you just open the door to graft, you open the door to cheating, dishonesty, and believe me, they took advantage of it and multiplied their salaries. But not only did they multiply their income, they developed downlines where they were chief collectors and they had collectors under them and they got a cut of everything down through the downline. And so here was a tax collector that was very rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was. He had heard about Jesus, and so he was short and he couldn't see him, so what did he do? He was not able because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, since he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Amazing story. And you see how that little song captures the reality of that story. 
Now next, we have really Zacchaeus' salvation experience. And it's really important that we understand this. We read in uh, verse 6 of Luke 19. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. Now immediately that indicates that publicly uh, these tax collectors were hated. And that's why you often have the word tax collector and sinners used in the same phrase. It was just common knowledge. So people begin to judge the situation. He's going to stay with a sinful man. He's going into his house. But we read on from Luke. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. Lord. And if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today, Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. Jesus told him. Because he too is a son of Abraham. Now again, keep in mind that he was not saved. He did not inherit eternal life because he gave money to the poor. He was not saved and, inherit, and inherited eternal life because he paid back those he had extorted. That was a result of his faith. And when he says, you're a son of Abraham, it indicates how he came to faith and salvation. You remember how Abraham was saved? Remember his salvation experience? Well, look at what we read in Romans chapter 4. If Abraham was justified by works, Paul wrote, he has something to boast about. And we might paraphrase. If Zacchaeus was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But going back to Abraham, we read, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, they will make you observe and do. For they are ministers of the law, and they make themselves your judges. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and lay on men's shoulders, and they are grievous to be borne. But they will not move them with one of their fingers. And all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders there at the garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, which is Master. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your Master, which is Christ, and all ye are brethren, and call no one your Creator upon the earth, or your Heavenly Father, for one is your Creator and Heavenly Father, even he who is in heaven. Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even he whom your heavenly Father sent, which is Christ, for he has sent him among you that you might have life. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased of him. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted of him. In the LDS Bible Dictionary, the word hypocrite means the word generally denotes one who pretends to be religious when he is not, though it is sometimes used to mean simply a bad man. It also means it was the besetting sin of the Pharisees and was severely condemned by the Lord. Jesus Christ is my King. 
And on the next day, much people that were come to the Passover feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had sent two of his disciples and got a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. That's in Zechariah, Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verse 9. And in Matthew 21, we read, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the colt and put on it their clothes. And Jesus took the colt and sat thereon, and they followed him. And a great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and also that followed after cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem will now be replicated in the second coming. We'll reread in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12, the following. And after this, I, who is Apostle John the Revelator, beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen.